The reading this evening is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it can be found on page 1163 of the Pew Bibles. 1163. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. And it is written that one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. In addition, we are sending with them our brother, who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you, so that the churches can see it. This is the word of the Lord. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nikki. Did anyone else hear that cheer when Nikki was reading? That could be good news, couldn't it? Anyway, let's have a prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much um, for who you are. Thank you so much for what you've done for us in the Lord Jesus, for all that you give us and all that you promise us. We pray that this evening as we um, look at these words together, that your grace might fill our hearts afresh and that it might overflow out of us towards others. Please change us tonight, we pray. Amen. Now, have you heard the phrase, put your money where your mouth is? 
heard that phrase before? My eldest son, George, here he is on the screen, has been saying that to me uh, just recently. Um, two of my younger children have started an athletics running thing on a Monday night, and while they're having loads of fun, me and George go off to the local field and do some fitness, you know, like shuttle runs and sprints and things like that, just to sort of, he likes his food, so um, we've got going on it. And, and on the first week, I wanted to see where we were at, so I, I made him run one kilometre. Okay, just one, that's not very far. It's not child abuse, it's fine. One kilometre, okay. But it was a very painful six minutes and 40 seconds. If you don't know that, slow, okay. And it was painful for him because he likes desserts and for me because I had to run with him shouting, come on, George, you can do it for six minutes, 40 seconds so that he didn't stop before he got across the line. Anyway, long story short, to encourage him to get his time a bit better and to get a bit fitter, I said, if you can get to six minutes or below by the end of summer, I'll buy you something. That was the promise. Okay, week two, um, and George ran one whole minute faster. <laughs> Five minutes 40. I don't really know how you improve by a minute in a week. I might have been hustled by a 10-year-old. But, but here's the point. I owe him, I've promised him a gift now, and he's saying, Dad, Put your money where your mouth is. Come on, pay up. You've promised me you're going to give me this money. And surprisingly, that's not a million miles away from where we are in 2 Corinthians this evening. Have a look down at verses 10 and 11, will you, with me. Um, it says this. Oh, 10, 11, that's wrong, I think. Have a look down. No, that's right, that'll do. And, and here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last you were, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Ready? Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do so may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. See, the Corinthian church, they've promised to give a financial gift. Back in 1 Corinthians, an earlier letter from Paul to the church, he tells him, just put a little bit of your money aside every week, and then when I come back, I'll collect it all and take it to the struggling churches in Jerusalem. That was the plan. And we're about a year on, and now Paul is writing to encourage them to keep going on what they've promised, to finish what they've started. Or as he puts it in verse 7, to excel, to overflow in this grace of giving. So basically, Paul's saying, Corinthians... Now it's time to pay up. put your money where your mouth is. And you see, so far in 2 Corinthians, it's been sort of, they've been hot and cold with Paul, haven't they? Paul's had to share his passion for the gospel all over again. Uh, Paul, his, his ministry looks outwardly weak, but he's had to convince them that actually God's bringing real life and fruit from it. That his ministry is really Jesus-shaped. That they've got to be all in for that with eyes on the future. And last week, if you remember, he was praising them for how they responded to being corrected. But now the topic of money is coming up. How about that money that you've promised? So how does Paul convince a church that's sort of in and out with him to give their hard-earned cash to people that they've never met? But the thing is, we need to listen up because whatever Paul said here, it worked. All right, we read in Romans 15, 26, it's on the screen here, um, for Macedonia and Achaia, that's, that's where Corinth is, were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. The striking thing is, although he could as an apostle, Paul doesn't just command them. Come on then, put your money where your mouth is. Have a look at verse 8. I'm not commanding you. You don't have to give, he says. But, but instead, what he does over the next couple of chapters is to show them again the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the good news of Jesus and how it changes people and how generous giving overflows from a heart that is all in for God and his people. So really, Paul isn't saying, um, put your money where your mouth is. More, he's saying, put your money where your heart is. Where, where is your heart, Corinthians, or St. Andrews? Where is your heart? Because your wallet, well, it's going to follow. And I just want to be clear as we, as we start. I, me, St. Andrews, if you're not a Christian here, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, we are not interested in your money. 
We are not after your money in the slightest. You are so welcome here with us. We're excited that you're here. And, and, and look, please do keep listening because we desperately want you to come to know this Jesus that we know. To come to know and experience and delight in his grace and all that he's done for you. So do keep listening. That we're going to see just a couple of things. We're going to see, Paul says, to encourage the generosity of the Christians, to, to put their money where their heart is, they need grace and they need confidence. Okay, we're going to be super slow to start with looking at one sentence. Then we get a bit quicker and look at like six sentences. And then we're going to rush the last bit, the second half of the passage, if we've got time at the end. Okay, that's where we're going. So first thing, big thing ready. If you want to be a generous giver, you need grace. What do I mean by that? Let's dive right into the middle of the passage. Check out verse 9 with me, will you? It is sort of a one-sentence overview of Christianity, of the good news of Jesus, but it's using the language of money. It says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That is a sentence full of amazing things. Paul, Paul says, before Jesus took on flesh, before he became a human, he was rich. He lived in eternal glory, Father, Son, and Spirit together, being constantly praised and worshipped, sat on the throne of the universe. And all through the Bible, we get little glimpses of what that was like. Here's one here, look, in Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, two wings they covered their eyes, with two they covered their feet, with two they were flying. They were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. We were just singing a song, weren't we, about what compares to Jesus absolutely nothing. Jesus was rich in every sense of the word, beyond anything we can imagine. Yet, verse 9, for your sake he became poor. Now that might be, right, the understatement of all of history or the understatement of at least the last century, okay? For your sake he became poor. Uh, Jesus, the Lord Almighty himself, became a weak and feeble human, an eternal God clothed, right, in flesh and bone. Born in a filthy stable, giving a dirty feeding trough for a cot. Could you just get your, can you even start to get your head around that? Phil and Jill, right, are about to have a baby, aren't they? Can you imagine if I said to them, right, hey guys, I've got you a cracking present. Um, little hint, don't buy a cot, okay? I found this thing. It was all the rage in first century Bethlehem, okay? Even Jesus had one, right? Um, and then I turned up with something like this, a rusty filthy feeding trough and said, go on, put your little girl in that. She'll love it. Can you imagine that? I don't think they'd ever invite me back to their house again. It's crazy. But, but, but that's where Jesus was. Jesus didn't come as a, a king to rule. He willingly came as a servant. How does his life end? No clothes, no money, no house, no friends, no glory, no honour, cut off from his father, hanging on a cross like a criminal. That is a long way from the glory and the riches of heaven. Why on earth would Jesus choose to do that? Verse 9, so that you, so that me, so that anybody through his poverty might become rich. Oh, amazing, right? Paul's already, um, Paul's already told us back in chapter 5 what's happening on the cross. Here it is. Phil read it a minute ago. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the rich, sinless one, died on a cross as a poor sinner so that you, so that me, so that anybody who trusts in him can be forgiven can have their sins, their rejection of God paid for, can have an eternal relationship with the God of the universe, can become rich. Look, if you're a Christian here tonight, in Jesus, you have an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. 
Whatever is building in your bank account is nothing in comparison to that. You are a son or daughter of God Almighty. And one day you will inherit a perfected creation and live there with your perfect creator. You're so rich. How do we, how do we get all this? How does anybody make this their own? Grace. Remarkably, it's a free gift on offer for anybody who would come to Jesus. This is God's free generosity being poured out to anybody who wants it. Do you know the Lord's generosity to you? Has his grace filled your heart yet? Have you come yet to Jesus to receive this free gift? If not, can I just ask you, what, what is stopping you? Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. If you haven't before, why not ask him to pour his grace into your heart tonight? It is a free gift that has infinite worth. If we're going to be those who are generous, we need grace. In fact, we need to go, we need overflowing grace is what Paul is going to say to us. Now, look, I listened to a talk um, earlier uh, this week, the other day, by a guy called Richard Garnett, an amazing Christian bloke. Really sadly, he's, he's dying, and it won't be long before he is with Jesus. But he gave a talk to some church leaders, okay, the other day about giving, wanting to share some of the wisdom God has given him before he dies. It's a great talk, but he had a couple of facts and figures that really sort of hit me in the gut, Okay, and I sort of hope in a nice way they'll do the same thing for you. Okay, here we go. Number one, if you earn your sort of house, if you earn around £30,000 a year, you or your house, you are in the top 1% of the richest people on the planet. Okay? Fact number two, the evangelical church in the West, us, right? Us and churches like us, are the wealthiest, yet the stingiest Christians who have ever lived on the planet. They hit me. They hit me in the gut. They, they sting when you hear those things. And we know the answer. Paul says it's not just to command you to give more, but to be reminded of God's grace to you. But how does that work? Because the Corinthians right? they... They, like many of us, they already know and have received God's grace. His free generosity, Paul is reminding them, though, that God's grace doesn't just forgive us and draw us into God's family, but it should also change us, ready, and overflow out of us in loads of ways. Verse 6 and 7, ready, Paul says this, So we urge Titus, just as he had, heard, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel or overflow in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we've kindled in, in you, see that you also excel or overflow in this grace of giving. Now check this out, because Becky thought she had a good PowerPoint slide the other day. But just look at this. Go for it, Sam. It's supposed to be a bit like this. Ready? To be full of grace, right? God's grace comes in, it fills us up, and then it's supposed to overflow out of us to others. Good, hey? Yeah? But that's the picture. That's what grace is supposed to do. It's supposed to flow in, fill us up, and overflow out of us to others. God's grace in, God's grace out. And did you see at the start of the passage... The Macedonians, well, they are a great example of God's grace filling them up and overflowing to others. Just have a look down because it's a remarkable few verses, starting at verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. 
they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Do you see in verse 1? It's by God's grace that they give so beautifully. Their giving is so Jesus-shaped, isn't it? They're a church that's suffering. We saw last week in 7 verse 5, Paul said what a struggle it was when he was in Macedonia, harassed and conflicts and sleepless nights. By all accounts, it's a tough place to be a Christian. Verse 2 in our passage, they're in a severe trial. They live in, in extreme poverty, and yet their joy is overflowing. They're so full of God's grace, they can't hold it back. It overflows out of them, so much so that they not only gave generously, right, but they begged. They begged Paul to be able to give money they didn't even have. It's a remarkable overflow of grace. I think probably Paul didn't even ask them because he knew their situation. And yet they begged him to be able to be a part of God's work because God's grace was overflowing out of them to others. I don't know about you, but that doesn't often describe my heart when it comes to giving to God's work. Did you see in verse 5, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. They've been captivated by Jesus and all that he's done for them. His grace has filled them up to overflowing. And so now they are all in for Jesus and all in for his people, wallets included, even when it's painful. They're so like Jesus, aren't they, in the way their grace flows out to others. And we often say that you shouldn't compare, right? I say that to my kids all the time. Don't compare yourself with those kids over there. You just do your own thing. But actually, there's a good comparison too, isn't there? There's a good way to compete or to compare yourself, sorry, to somebody else. When you look at something beautiful in someone and you go, oh, I want to be like that. Oh, yeah, I wish I could be just like they are. They're so like Jesus. And that's what Paul's doing in verse 8. He's getting the Corinthians to compare their love with the Macedonians, to look at how they live and to say, oh yeah, I want to be like those guys over there. I want to know Jesus' grace like that. See, it's striking, isn't it, that Paul nowhere here talks about numbers. He doesn't talk about numbers. He doesn't talk about how much to give. If you look in verse 11 and 12, there's a little bit about giving um, according to your means. We've all got different capacities, haven't we? We've all got different amounts in the bank. But but you see, Paul is saying, whether we give generously or not, it's not actually about how much we've got in the bank. The Macedonians had next to nothing, and yet God says they gave generously. Actually, what's going to motivate generous giving is a heart that's been gripped and changed and filled up and overflows with God's grace to us in Jesus. So I guess the question is... Do you have a heart like those Macedonians? When when was the last time you were desperate to give money to something that was for Jesus and his people, even if it meant you had to tighten your purse in other areas? We need to pray, don't we? I need to pray for fresh eyes to see Jesus' grace so that we might grow to be those who are all in for Jesus and his people, all in for him in how we speak and how we live, all in for him here in how we use our money. Put your money where your heart is. To do that, you need grace. We need Jesus to be able to do that. Secondly, really, really quickly, we need confidence. We need confidence. We need grace and we need confidence. The second half of the passage seems to be Paul uh, explaining that this liberal gift, like he says in verse 20, is going to be treated and administered, given out really carefully for Jesus and for his people. He wants the Corinthians to have confidence that their money is being used wisely, basically. And so to start with in 13 to 15, he talks about how the money is going to be used. He says, we're not trying to make you poor so that other people have got loads, He says, you've got plenty at this moment, and so wouldn't it be great if you could give to those needy Christians over there? That's real life stuff. If you don't give this money, they don't eat. 
If you don't give this money, that church doesn't get planted. Paul says your money is going to be used wisely for Jesus and for his people. Uh, and look, I just want to encourage us, right? Do you remember Katie Terrett? She, she, at the moment, she is in Montenegro because we here at St. Andrews gave her money. But what's she doing there? She's there to encourage the Christians that are there and to share the gospel with people that don't know Jesus. And I don't know about you, I didn't give her very much at all. I think like a tenner, right? Not very much, but I have been so invested on her WhatsApp group, praying for what's going on. I've been interested in it, been seeing her pictures. I feel so invested because I know where my money's gone and what it's trying to achieve. That's a great thing, confidence. That gives me confidence to give more in the future. Or, or you know, last, last little thing, really. Paul basically spends seven or eight verses here talking about his finance team. Right? He talks about Titus and two of the blokes that we don't know their names. And he's not saying, look, I'm sending the heavies, and if you don't pay up, well, they're coming for your money anyway. What he's saying is, I'm sending you the sort of people that love you and that love Jesus and that want to use your money for the good of Jesus and his people. And that is supposed to give them confidence in their giving. And I can say, hand on heart, that the people that handle our money at St. Andrews, they love you, and they love Jesus, and they want to use your generous gifts to serve him and his people. But if you're not sure, in a couple of weeks, we've got a financial presentation from Tim. Make sure you're there. Make sure you're listening. Make sure you're ready to ask questions. That is going to give you confidence as God's grace overflows out of you in gifts to others. I've definitely gone on too long. Let me just uh, pray as we finish. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. Lord, that is everything to us. What you've done for us, who you've made us, what you promise us. Lord, if we don't know the gospel yet, please open our eyes and our hearts to Jesus that we might see him tonight. And Lord, for, for those of us who do know Jesus, why, might we be thrilled by his grace towards us again? And might it drive us to be all in for Jesus and his people, even with our money. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks.